The Lord has provided us a beautiful day to be able to come out here to Friendship Missionary Baptist Church this morning, and we're very thankful for it. We're uh, thankful for the church uh, for providing this opportunity and pray the church will be blessed and anyone that listens. I uh, certainly want to thank each and every one that has uh, said a prayer on our behalf uh, for this effort, for the effort of any preacher anywhere. Uh, and we certainly need to be prayerful one for another. Uh, we're going to look in the book of Matthew in the 27th chapter. We're going to read a few verses of scripture and then may refer to some others as the Lord gives us guidance and uh, we just ask you to pray for us. Matthew 27 and 15 says, Now at the feast the governor was not to release, was wont to release unto the people a prisoner whom they would. And they had a notable prisoner called Barabbas. Therefore when they were gathered together, Pilate said unto them, whom will ye that I release unto you, Barabbas or Jesus, which is called Christ? For he knew that for envy they had delivered him. And when he sat down at the judgment seat, his wife sent unto him, saying, Have thou nothing to do with this just man? For I have suffered many things this day and a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. And the governor answered and said unto them, Whether of the twain will you that I release unto you? And they said, Barabbas. And Pilate saith unto them, What shall I do with Jesus? What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? And they all said unto him, Let him be crucified. And the governor said, Why, what evil hath he done? But they cried the more, Let him be crucified. And Pilate saw and that, could, uh, that he could prevail nothing, but that rather tumult was made and took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. Then answered all the people and said, His blood be upon us and on our children. Then released Barabbas, he released Barabbas unto them, and when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Now, in my mistakes in reading, and I blundered a lot there, uh, that's uh, the 15th uh, through the 26th verse of Scripture here of Matthew 27, and we'll probably read some more uh, along this as the Lord guides us. We find here as the Lord was delivered there to Pilate of the Jews uh, to be crucified, and uh, they wanted him dead. They wanted him away uh, from them. They had already given him a mock trial, uh, and all he said in, in, in his answer to them when they begged him, tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. He says, thou hast said, nevertheless, I say unto you hereafter, you shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. And it says, then the high priest rent his clothes and he spoke and said, he has spoke blasphemy. What further uh, need have we of witnesses? Behold, ye have heard his blasphemy. So right now, uh, there, that's what they had found him guilty of is blasphemy. All he did was tell the truth. He told the truth that he was the Son of God. These Jewish people, this Sanhedrin court, uh, these pious uh, uh, Pharisees uh, and Sadducees, they didn't want him to be the Son of God. Uh, he didn't come like that he, they wanted him to. Uh, he wasn't royalty as they would see it. He come uh, uh, in a uh, humble manner. Uh, he didn't uh, speak like they wanted him to speak. He didn't dress like they wanted him to dress. And the things that he said, it condemned them. And they didn't want him to be the Son of God. They wanted to be away with this man. And they brought him to Pilate. Pilate, knowing that there was nothing that he had done that was wrong or worthy of death, he knew that they had a custom to be able to release at least a prisoner here at this time uh, to not be put to death. And they had this notable prisoner there named Barabbas. And he brought that individual specifically up to them. Uh, we know that the Lord died on the cross, uh, one on his right hand and another on his left. Both of them were guilty of death. Uh, but we find here that he brought up this one man, Barabbas, uh, to their attention. Uh, that, hey, would you want me to release him uh, and not Christ? I want you to see here for just a moment of time what kind of man this man Barabbas was uh, that they called for. They said, release Barabbas, crucify Jesus. 
We find in the scriptures in the book of Mark, in the uh, 15th chapter and verse 6, it says, Now at the feast he released unto them one prisoner, whomsoever they desired. And there was one named Barabbas, which lay bound with them, that had made insurrection uh, with them, who had committed murder and insurrection. So we find here uh, that Barabbas was a seditious man. He was a murderer, as the scriptures uh, here bear out. There's another place over here in the book of Luke. We want to look at all three of them uh, concerning this man Barabbas. Uh, Luke in the 23rd chapter, we look here at verse, uh, let's see here, verse uh, 23, verse 18 and 19, I believe it is. And it says in, a, uh, of an, uh, in verse 17, it says, For necessity he must release unto them one at the feast. And they cried out all at once, Away with this man, and release unto us Barabbas, who for certain sedition made in the city for murder, uh, and for murder was cast into prison. We also can find in the book of John in the 18th chapter, I mean, y'all just bear with me here, in the 18th chapter uh, in verse 40, and they all cried again, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. So we want you to, to see here that when Pilate uh, gave them the opportunity to release a sinner, to release one that uh, uh, was, uh, uh, to release unto them one that was not guilty, one that was worthy of being released, that one that was not worthy of death, one that didn't deserve death. He tried to release unto them, tried to encourage them and present to them to, uh, uh, to release Jesus because he knew that he was a just man, that there was no sin in him. But there was another man, Barabbas, there whom they were told to call for. And the scriptures, as we've read to you, we look and we find that he was a seditious man. He was a stir up of the people. Uh, what insurrection he tried there in that city among the Jews and the Romans, I don't know. But one that was notable, one that everybody knew that he was guilty of. He wasn't either just guilty of that. The scripture there in John said he was a robber. He was one that stole from people. Uh, and it was also said that he was a murderer. So this was well known uh, among the people uh, what this man was guilty of. And here Pilate, he knew that Jesus was innocent. There was no guilt, no guile found within him. And Pilate was trying to release him. But they were stirred up to ask for the notable prisoner. So here we find that they would rather have had this man that was guilty of all these sins and worthy of death, and they would rather have him released and to let Jesus went and died in his place. And I'm thankful that the Lord took my place. I'm thankful that he took your place on the cross of Calvary because the truth of the matter is we're all worthy of death. We all deserve to die and go to a devil's hell. In fact, we find there in the scriptures in the book of Revelation that John there, while he was on the Isle of Patmos uh, for the word of God, that he saw all of mankind without no hope, that they couldn't find anyone to take the book and loose the seven seals thereof. Uh, and we look and we find that he wept. He wept because he saw all mankind unworthy uh, to take this word right here and to live by it, to not live uh, a life where any sin is committed and they couldn't find no one in heaven and in earth. Uh, they looked through all generations and they looked and they saw me and you. They saw this man Barabbas. They saw that whole congregation of people. And what they found was nobody was worthy. But yet Jesus stepped forward, stood as a lamb slain uh, before the foundation of the world to take your and I place because of our sins. But here we look at they desired to let this guilty man go. And we find here that uh, he said to them, what sh who shall I release? And they said, Barabbas. He said, what shall I do with this man that is called uh, with Jesus, which is called to Christ? And they said unto him, let him be crucified. Now, this crucifixion, uh, to be crucified, to be put on that cross and to uh, be put out there on a public display, uh, to be nailed to, to a cross. He said, who do you want to be crucified? Uh, this, you can read and study of how hard it was on them to catch their breath, having to push themselves up, 
uh, the extreme pressure that was on their bones and upon their body uh, to hang there, uh, joints being pulled loose, uh, the uh, pressure that was on that diaphragm uh, and on their legs to push up to try to get breath, how hard that was on them. It was a cruel death. It was one that was meant to be cruel on anyone that had to suffer for it. Uh, and here we find uh, that everybody that had suffered uh, such thing up to this point had most likely deserved that. But I want you to know that this that they called for on this man Jesus, our Lord and Savior, he didn't deserve that. He didn't deserve that death at all. Uh, but they wanted him to suffer. They didn't want him to just die. They wanted him to suffer. They wanted him to feel pain. They wanted his followers to see him feeling pain. He'd asked them, he said, what evil has he done? Well, what's the charge on him? Uh, present to me. Uh, tell me. What, what wrong has this man done that you want this? They didn't present evidence. They just said, let him be crucified. In another part of the scripture, I believe it says, away with them. Just get him away. I want you to understand they couldn't present one bit of proof uh, that this man Jesus uh, should have been crucified, but he was there to be crucified because I was guilty, because you were guilty, because the whole world is guilty. That is the guilt that he carried there to Calvary's cross. What was he guilty of? Barabbas said was a man of insurrection. I find that the Lord, he brought peace. They said he was a murderer, and yet the Lord... He preserved life and saved life. They said in the scriptures, this man was a robber, but the Lord never stole from anywhere uh, in anyone. Uh, we find that he said, even the foxes have holes, but I have not a place to lay my head, even though the Lord owned everything. Uh, what we find was that he didn't have a home here, uh, a house to call his own, a place to abide. Uh, he didn't take from others uh, to give to himself. In fact, we find uh, that when they didn't have enough, that God would take the loaves and the fishes and he'd multiply them to feed them and enough left over uh, to fill baskets up. I want you to understand uh, that the Lord wasn't guilty. They were guilty. You and I are guilty of the reason that our Lord had to be crucified, that he had to suffer. There on that cross of Calvary for our sins. So we want to look here for just a little bit. Just a little bit more here. Now, I want you to know, uh, and I pray the Lord to help me. Now, when they crucified somebody, and they put them out there and open. This wasn't done in some chamber somewhere, and only a few people got to see it. They done it out in the open. They done it out in the open so that whatever the men or the individuals that were there being crucified out there in public for everybody to see, whatever they were guilty of, and everybody would know what they's guilty of, that this would uh, dissuade other people from doing what they were guilty of. Uh, we talk about that in our day and time. I hear people say, well, if we had public execution, we had public hangings, people would think more about uh, stealing and murder and killing if they realized that there was a penalty for it and a swift penalty. I want you to understand, I, I don't disagree with that statement at all because what people would see is this person killed somebody and look what's happened to them. This person stole and look what's happened to them. Well, that was the intention there at that time to punish people in a horrible way in the open public so people would not do what they were there doing, had uh, got them to that point. Now, we know that the Lord hadn't done anything. All the Lord had done is come to this world to die for the sins of all mankind. All the Lord had done is heal the sick. All the Lord had done is heal those that were blind, deaf, and dumb. Cause the lame to walk. Uh, to help people who were in need. Uh, to preach the gospel of His Father uh, here in this world. And to do the will of His Father. To set up His kingdom in here in this world. That is what the Lord was guilty of. Of doing the good works of God. But we look and we find that they desired to uh, punish him. Now, I won't say this. Pilate could have turned him loose if he wanted to. He, he acted like his hands was tied because the people was causing such a ruckus about it. And he washed his hands in a basin, uh, some water on them, said he was guilt, not guilty of the blood of this man. I'm going to tell you what, he's as guilty as the rest of us are. 
uh, uh, doing that did not absolve him of guilt. He was guilty, guilty, guilty. He could have cleared, his soldiers could have cleared that square, that area, wherever it was. They were gathered, to get, gathered together. He could have cleared them out. He could have let him loose if he'd have want to. But by the uh, divine will of God and his foreknowledge, he was delivered to that time. He knew what Pilate would do. Pilate was a coward. Pilate was a sinner. And he wanted that to please those people. Therefore, he was guilty so of the blood of our Lord and Savior as well. And the scriptures say that he scourged him and delivered him to be crucified. So he had him whipped. And we've heard many times of uh, the uh, whipping that the Lord uh, uh, um, suffered for us. And they took him and they tied him to a pole and they stripped him down. And they would take and have all these letter strips off of that. And they would put rocks and bone and, and, and metal, whatever they could find that would inflict pain and tear the hide off. And they would whip him and pull. And when they'd pull, uh, they would pull his hide off and they'd beat him about to death. Uh, I can imagine as he stood there first tied and that first whip came of uh, the pain that came along with that. And as they kept whipping him stronger and with more vigor, uh, with more anger uh, to make this man that claimed to be the Son of God to bring him to his knees and I'm satisfied his body was weakened of him all the beating uh, that he took. But I want you to know they took pleasure those Roman soldiers took pleasure in beating our Lord. They took pleasure in beating Him. I want you to know today that they beat Him. Then it says here that they had stripped Him of His clothes and they put on a scarlet robe. They put a crown, a crown of thorns upon His head. Uh, they bowed down in front of Him and gave Him a little reed uh, in His hand like a scepter uh, that a king would have. And they bowed down in front of Him and they mocked Him. They mocked him uh, because they did not believe he was the Son of God. Uh, they wanted to mock him, uh, make a mockery out of him. And they done this in the public. They didn't do this in no hidden place. Put his robe back on him, carried him there, put a cross upon him uh, uh, to bear going there. And this one man, Simon, they gave him uh, to carry with him. And he went there to Golgotha's Hill, to Calvary, as the scripture were also called it. And then they nailed him in his hands and in his feet. And they lifted him up and they put him in that, put that in that ground. And there he hung between the heavens and the earth, just as he said that he would, that he would uh, must be lifted up to draw all men to him. And there he was between a thief on the left hand and a thief on the right hand, and he was suffering in his old body. Now here it says that he took his clothes, they had stripped him naked to shame him, to shame our Lord. Uh, and he bore our shame. I want you to know today uh, that people walk around about half naked uh, of their own volition. Uh, they dress in such a way uh, to uh, uh, expose their self. But I can assure you uh, that if you took any one of those same people and you stripped them down against their own will, uh, that there would be a shame that would go along with that. I want you to know today that our Lord, he bore our shame of our sins uh, and our nakedness. He took that on the tree. I want you to know there as he bore that. Uh, I want you to know they walked around just as the scriptures say, I believe it is in the book of Psalms, that the dog circled him. They lusted after our Lord. They brought upon him great shame for you and I. And they parted his garments and they cast lots for him. They went around and it says they passed by uh, they uh, passed by and reviled him, wagging their heads. Now I want you to look here. This is in Matthew 27 and 39. This says here, reviled him. That's to blaspheme. To speak, as the scriptures say, to speak of the supreme being in terms of impious and reverence. I want you to understand that when they went around and they were blaspheming, saying he said he could tear down the temple and build it again in three days. If he be the Son of God, let him save himself. Why, they, they mocked him. Uh, they looked upon him with disdain. And they did that because of our sins, because of their own. He was there on that cross of Calvary. And they bore, he bore it all. Even that thief on the left said, If thou be the Son of God, get ourselves down from here. Didn't believe on him. And then the one on the right 
He knew that he was there justly, but this man, he knew Jesus was just. He knew he didn't deserve that death and asked the Lord to remember him when he came to his kingdom. And the Lord told him, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Saved him there, man, worthy of death. A deserving, knew he deserved what he was going to get, but yet he put his trust in Jesus. And that's what the world should do today. Put their trust in Jesus, knowing that you deserve the death that he took. Now, he took our place on that cross of Calvary. But we want to go just a little further into this. And it's plenty there. Right, right there, if I closed the book, and I said, that's all I want to do. Uh, that's all I have on my heart. That'd be plenty for us to be reminded again of what our Lord done for you and I. Has done for a world that has turned their back on him. For people who believe in idol gods, for those uh, that would still today say he has never come, he died for them. But we look and we go back to this. All oh, that pain they inflicted upon him and him uh, up there on that cross. These Jews, they wanted him there so those followers of him would know you better not keep going the track that you was going on or this will be you. It was there to intimidate them. It was there to deter them from the actions of following after the Lord. We look and we find in the scriptures over in the book of John in the 15th chapter, it says here, uh, well, I'm going to start at verse uh, 16. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. And a lot of people in the world would say, well, that's just meaning salvation and that a person has uh, no choice in whether they're saved or not. You know, there are going to be a certain number saved and, and that there ain't a thing anybody can do about it. Well, that's not true. The Scriptures say, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that calling is not just with the oral mouth, but it is from the heart of a broken heart and a contrite spirit. So I want you to understand that doctrine, uh, that there's just a certain number and that's it. The Scriptures teach me there's a number there that no man can number. I want you to understand today that if you want to believe that doctrine, if you want to believe that teaching, I can't keep you from it, but I want you to know that a man can be saved, a man, woman, a uh, boy or girl, when they're lost and separated from God, I'm going to tell you what, they'll be saved if they call on the Lord and they trust Him with all their heart. And it is wrong to tell somebody there ain't nothing we can do about it, just turn them loose. Well, maybe they will, maybe they won't. If that's the case, then what would there be of need of any gospel? What would there be of need of any church? Uh, if they didn't have any choice in it, that's just wrong is what it is. It's an erroneous teaching. So where he says, you have not chosen me, but I've chosen you, he's not talking. And you read here in this book of John in the 15th chapter where he's talking, I am the vine and you are the branches. He ain't just talking to save people. He's talking to his church, his church kingdom in this world. And I want you to understand that when a person is saved, then they're a fit kingdom for a fit individual for the kingdom of God. And when they draw, uh, join the Lord's church, they become a part of that vine, so to speak, so they can get their nourishment from the body of Christ, which he is the head. He said, so you have not chosen me. Oh, these people today, they take verses like this. I'll get around to what I'm getting to, but this is on my heart, and I'm going to speak it while I'm here. They make decisions. I choose Jesus. I have decided. I'm going to tell you what I decided when I was a little nine, nine, lost nine-year-old boy. I decided if I was going to be saved, I was going to have to call on him. I decided if I wanted to get rid of that fear of dying, I was going to have to seek him. And I came to an altar. You might not be on a mourner's bench when you get saved, but you'll be a mourner when you get saved. I can tell you that before you get saved, you'll be a mourner. You'll be a brokenhearted person. You'll be calling on the Lord from the depths of your heart. You'll realize there's nothing you can do, but only the Lord can do it. And when you put your trust in Him, He'll save you. But this notion, you'll just walk down an aisle, shake somebody's hand, uh, that you'll uh, just be decided of yourself, you're going to do better. Uh, that ain't no way. That is against the Word of God. There is no proof in that there's no salvation in that there is no security in that because all that is done of man and I'm going to tell you what the scriptures say it is the gift of God so it says you've not chosen me but I have chosen you and I believe he's speaking there of those that have been saved members of the church ordained you that you should go forth and bring forth fruit 
your fruits in mine, whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you that you love one another. He's talking amongst themselves. Love one another. Go and bring forth fruit. So among ourselves, we ought to love one another. Among ourselves, among the saved, baptized believers of the Lord's church, we ought to love one another. There's a message right there within its name. It says, but if the, and if the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. The world hates you. Now, it says, if you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you're not of the world, because I've chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that I've said unto you. The servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. So we look and we find here that the Lord told them, now you love one another. And we ought to, as members, saved people. Whether they're members of the Lord's church, we ought to love everybody, but especially those of the household of faith. That's what the scriptures teach us. But it says the world's going to hate you. Because if you were of the world, if you were like the world was, and you went along with the world, guess what? They're just going to hug you up. They're, they're going to treat you like one of their own. Because there is nothing about you that would reprove them. But it says here, if the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. So if we're out there doing what we should be, following in the footsteps of our Lord, He had warned this young church, don't be surprised, don't be shocked when it hates you too because it hated me. He said, if you were of the world, they'd love you. But because you're not of this world, it says here, but I've chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. I'm going to tell you what you might think. Uh, that doesn't happen even in our day and time, but it does. The scriptures say uh, that people don't come to the light lest their deeds be reproved. And I want you to understand that today when the church and saved individuals do what the Lord wants them to do and let that light shine, and it will condemn people's sin just by that. Just by being what the Lord wants you to be, People will despise you. They will hate you. They will attack you. And he's telling them there, this is going to happen. He said, but don't be surprised. He said, remember the word I've said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. So it, we're not greater than the Lord. So that's what he's saying. I'm the master and you're the servant. If they have persecuted me, and we know that they did, they will also, uh, they will also persecute you. If ye, if they have kept my saying, uh, they will keep yours also. So we find here that what he's telling them there is they're going to persecute you. They're going to hate you just like they hated me, even though they had no reason to hate the Lord. If you do what is right, people will despise you for it. Now, people of the church, people of that which is right, they will should love one another. But I want you to understand, I think sometimes that even saved people, they get to where they despise people who try to serve the Lord. What a shame and disgrace that it should be that someone should talk against someone. They'll call them do-gooders. Well, they think they're better than everybody else. Well, uh, they just think uh, they look down on everybody else. I'm going to tell you what, we shouldn't be pious like the Pharisees thinking we're better than anybody else. I don't care who that we are, uh, what church we're a member of. We shouldn't lift ourselves and exalt ourselves better than what we are. Uh, what we ought to do is live for our Lord and there are times living for our Lord that we'll condemn sin. There's times living for our Lord we'll withdraw ourselves from people who live in sin. And it is because of those things that people despise us. People hate the Lord. They hate His church. And I want you to understand they done that to our Lord uh, back in the long ago so that those disciples would not follow after Him. And they remembered what He told them. And they went on preaching and teaching the Word of God. Y'all bear with me. I'm going to go till I get done so y'all can pause it, stop, whatever you need to do. I'm going to go till I get done. We find here and say in the Scriptures that they brought him there, the apostles there in the book of Acts, uh, that Peter had went by a man, uh, and he said, Silver and gold have I none unto thee, uh, 
so, but such as I have, I give unto thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Not in his own name, but in the name of Jesus. Uh, and the man got up leaping and walking and praising the Lord and people uh, were against him and they brought him in and they told him uh, they were grieved. The scriptures say in Acts 4 and 2, but being grieved that they taught the people and preached through, the, uh, preached through Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They wanted him, them to stop talking in Jesus' name. Why? Because Jesus' name reproved them. Because he was a just man. Because Jesus was the light and he is the light. And he said, I uh, hear that, that being taught uh, and living right uh, and preaching him, it reproved them. And because it reproved them, they lashed out at them. That's what they done. When our deeds are reproved, when mine are, uh, I get uh, burred up sometimes uh, because I didn't like it. Uh, I remember one time, it's been many years ago, uh, I was in a service uh, there where I grew up in Siloam, and one of the deacons got up and he made a, a comment, and it was apparently it was a good service. I don't remember all that. He said, if you can't feel nothing here tonight, you need to get to asking the Lord to help you. Well, I don't know why that just aggravated me, but it did. And I went to my mama and I thought, well, I'll get some consolation from my mama. And I went to her and I said, what he just said, he don't know how I feel. She said, if you're this upset about it, maybe you do need to talk uh, to the Lord about it. I want you to understand. The Lord knew my heart was cold. I did. But I didn't want nobody telling it. I didn't want anything said. He didn't point me out and say, Kevin Harrison, you're cold as a cucumber. I want you to know but the Lord knew my condition. And when I heard that, I got upset at him, and it wasn't his fault. He had done nothing wrong. I never said nothing to nobody. I just told my mama. I never said nothing to nobody else. I wouldn't hurt that man or nothing. He was a good man. Dead and gone now. But the truth of what I'm trying to tell you is it's when the truth is presented, it will reprove us. And sometimes we take it. Many times we burr up. We buck against it. And, and we bow up against it like we, we're something. And we lash out. And that's what I was doing. I went to mama. Mama. She curbed me down. That's how she done a lot of times. She didn't really back me up like I wanted her to. We look and we find they brought him to him. And Peter told him, he said, now we're going to preach in his name. We're, we're, we're going to do what you want, uh, what we're going to do. And there ain't anything you can do. And they told him not to let it spread no further. And they kept going. And they brought him in again. They had been put in prison. And the angels had let him out. They brought him back again. Said, didn't we tell you? Didn't we tell y'all not to do this? What did he say here in uh, Acts 5 and 29? Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you slew and hanged on a tree. Him hath God exalted with, the, uh, uh, with his right hand to be the prince and savior, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses of these things, and so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God had given to them that obey him. What did they, when they heard it, they were cutting their heart. They lashed out on them. Gamaliel there said, let them alone. If this is not of God, it'll die. Oh, but if this be of God, there ain't a thing you can do to fight against it. They wanted to destroy them. And we find here that when they called them in, they beat them. Scriptures say here, it's in Acts uh, 5 and 40, and he agreed, and he, to him they agreed, and when they had called to the, again, the apostles and beaten them, they commanded them they should not follow in the name of Jesus and let them go. And they departed from the presence, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer the shame for his name. And in daily in the temple and in every house they ceased not to teach, Je teach and preach Jesus Christ. So here they were. They wanted to uh, completely do away with them. They said, if this ain't a God, it'll go away anyway. But they beat them. Physically beat these men. And they rejoiced at their persecution. They rejoiced at their suffering. That they were counted worthy to suffer for the name of the Lord. And they went away from there thrilled to death and get just fueled their fire to work harder for the Lord because they knew Satan was in the other matter and they kept on in every day in every house preaching and teaching. Even Saul, Saul there of Tarsus, he, he thought he thought that he was doing right in persecuting. He thought that these people were wrong and the Lord got a hold of him and brought him down and saved his soul, put his feet on the solid rock, changed the course of his life and he went on preaching and the scriptures teach me that about all this man suffered. Now we look over in Acts in the 20th chapter. It says here, uh, 
Verse 22, now therefore, and now behold, I go in the spit, bound in the spirit of Jerusalem, not knowing the things there shall befall me, saving the Holy Ghost witness in every city, saying that uh, it bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear to myself, so that I might finish my course with joy, the ministry, uh, and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus Christ to testify of the gospel of grace of God. He goes on also when they were worried about him being bound and suffering. In Acts 21 and 13, it says, Then Paul answered and said, what mean, what mean ye to weep and to break mine heart? For I am not ready to be bound only, but to die also with Jerusalem for the name of my Lord Jesus. These men were not moved. They were not cowered down. It didn't deter them. They didn't feel sorry for themselves. They didn't have a pity party. What they did is they let that by the power of God fuel their fire to press on even harder for our Lord and Savior. They wasn't afraid. They wasn't afraid to die. They wasn't afraid to die. They wasn't afraid to give up their life. Uh, they weren't afraid of any of that. They were willing to suffer and die for our Lord that the gospel would keep going forward. And I want you to know that people will talk about us in this day and time. They will run us down, and in time last, they will yet again persecute the Christians. Even in this country in which we live, across the world, I hear what things I hear, they're already persecuting. People who preach the name of Jesus in foreign lands, that they are taking them, and they are beating them, and they are killing them, and they are kidnapping their children for the name of Jesus to deter people from preaching Jesus. We think with just a little tongue lashing, somebody might give us. Uh, they, the scriptures, book of Jeremiah, it says, let us smite him with a tongue. Uh, people might talk about us. People might have slurs to say about us. Let us take that and move forward. Let it not deter us. Let us go bound forward by the Holy Spirit to serve God. They are doing that. The devil is doing that to try to get us to cower down. Let us not cower down. Let us not cower down. Over in 2 Corinthians 4, uh, we're going to start at verse 6. For God, who had commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give light to the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. For we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Oh, what a treasure. People are looking all over the world. I remember as a boy, I'd watch shows, and, uh, and they were trying to find the fountain of youth. And they would hunt through all these wilderness and all these uh, 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 forests to find a place. And, 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 and there's movies made about finding something that will preserve life and make a man stronger and make him uh, uh, immortal. Let me tell you what I found as a little nine-year-old boy. They made the inward man of me. Oh, they will never die. I found the Lord as a little nine-year-old boy when He saved my soul. And in this whole outward vessel that His Lord so treading with sin, oh, I felt the Lord so greatly, felt His cause, but within this whole body that is getting older and getting more weak. Oh, and there's people that might listen to this today that might be sick, might be homebound, might be bound in a hospital or in a nursing home and can't get out like they once did. Oh, let me tell you, if you've been saved by the grace of God within you, your spirit is renewed every day. You've got a treasure in your earthen vessel this morning. Oh, don't be discouraged. The day will come uh, that Christ will relieve you of the troubled body and He will call you to your heavenly home and one day we'll all be changed in the twinkle of an eye. Scripture says, Have treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. That's what a lot of people are trying to make it about. They're trying to make it about them. But we need to make it where it lies, about our Lord. Notice what it says. We're troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For the which we are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then death working in us, but life in you. What is Paul telling this church here? What is he saying? In me I've got a treasure. 
And because of Jesus and I, we are troubled all around us, but we're not distressed. We, we're not tore up. We get so easily. Kevin, uh, I get to wring my hands and worry, what are we going to do? Mostly what I worry about is inward things, not the outward things. Well, uh, we need to, we need to be, we might be troubled, but we shouldn't be distressed. We might be perplexed, but we shouldn't be in despair. We might be persecuted someday, physically. We might be talked about today, but let me tell you what, we're not forsaken. The Lord, uh, Paul said one time when everybody had forsaken him, yet the Lord stood with him. I'm going to tell you what, you might not have anybody where you're at when they come attack you, but let me tell you who will stand with you. Our Lord will stand with you. It says here, cast down but not destroyed, bearing about always the body of our Lord and Savior. That Those marks, uh, what he went through, he said, the servant is not greater than the master. If they hated me, they'll hate you. If they persecuted me, they'll persecute you. If they talked about me, they'll talk about you. If they mocked me, they'll mock you. If they hated me, they'll hate you. Uh, if they despise you, they'll despi uh, despise me. They'll despise you. Let me tell you, if you're going that route and that's happening to you and that is something you're going through, let it be known to you this day. It is because you're following in the footsteps of our great Lord and Savior and because you follow in those footsteps because you're walking and following after the Bible after the teachings of God's holy word and his son Jesus they'll despise you it's their problem it is their heart that is not right not yours so don't be distressed don't be perplexed let us hold on let us not be discouraged book of Isaiah now bear with me Book is Isaiah 41 and 10. This is my mother's favorite verse on the headstone out there. It says, Fear not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I'll help thee, yea, I'll uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Don't be discouraged. Don't be cast down. Don't, don't give up. Don't think, well, there's, there's nothing else that I can do and I should just give up. No, no. Press on. Press on. Let me tell you about some of these men that stood there that day to those Jews. Let me tell you about Peter. Peter, the script, uh, what I learned from history, says he was crucified upside down. When it come time for his death, for them to put him to death, they crucified him upside down. and said, why would they do it upside down? Because he didn't feel he was worthy to be crucified in the same manner as his Lord. Andrew was crucified, it says, in an X-shaped cross. James was beheaded by the sword. John that wrote the Re uh, book of Revelation, he was boiled in oil, but he wound up dying of old age. Philip was crucified by Bartholomew, uh, was beaten, his scriptures say flayed, his flesh cut upon him, and he was uh, uh, crucified head down. Thomas was killed by the spear. James, he was pushed out of a temple as, it, as I found, and then he didn't die from that, so they beat him to death. Let me tell you about Paul. Paul, he said, at the time of my departure is in hand, Oh, he was looking forward to it. He, he, he indicated there in Acts. He said, I'm not, I ain't afraid to be bound and somebody to bind me up, carry me there to Jerusalem. I, that's the least of my worries. He said, I'm ready to die in the name of our Lord and Savior and for his name. I'm ready to give my life. And when it come time uh, for him to die, for them to behead him, for them to take his head off, he ran. He ran and laid it down. And for the name of Jesus. No, I don't believe he was deterred. He counted it worthy to suffer that for our Lord. There was a man named Polycarp that was affected by these men. When he died, it says, 80 and 6 years have I served Christ. They wanted him to deny the Lord. To deny him. You know, that's what people want us to do today. They want us to deny the Lord. When they are asking you to say something's not sin that is sin, they're trying to get you to deny the Lord when they're trying to get you to go along and compromise with things of this world that the Lord's teaching does not go along with, then they're trying to get you to deny the Lord. Now, they might not think that's what they're doing, but I'm going to tell you what, that's what it is. And they wanted him to deny his name. And he said this, 86 years have I served Christ, and he never did me wrong. How can I blaspheme my king who saved me? They wanted to nail him. Nail him to this cross. 
He grants me to endure the fire. They was going to burn him alive. They put him there and they put him in the middle of it and he's going to set fire around it and burn him alive. So he, who, uh, he who grants me to endure the fire will enable me also to remain on the pry unmoved without the sec uh, security of nails. You ain't got to hold me here. Ah, oh, the Lord that will help me. It, 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 you don't need nails to hold me here. You don't need them. The Lord will help me. And they say that they lit that on fire. And what I've read in different accounts is that fire went up around him. Didn't touch him. It went up around him. And it says that he almost looked like he had a glow, like, a, uh, like bread in the oven. A glow to him. And it was up around him. And they witnessed this. You know why? Because hey, the Lord hadn't forsaken him. And then they poked him and they speared him in the side and blood and water, it, it came out and, and they wound up, they killed him. But he wasn't going to deny the Lord even in the face of death. We've had our brothers and sisters in the Lord who they persecuted and ran out. They beheaded them and they put their heads on stakes to try to intimidate people from being a Christian but being a follower of our Lord and Savior. Try to intimidate them. They would take their children from them. They would kill them and they would try to get them to deny Jesus. Let me tell you what. Thank the Lord they didn't. Hey, in this country, before it was formed in the United States of America, they have beaten them. Taken preachers and drug them out of the pulpit and whooped them. Beat them. Beat them on the road because they preached and teached Jesus because it reproved them. Just know that if trouble comes, trouble comes, it is what the Lord said would happen. And they do this so that others will see and they'll be intimidated to do that which is right for the Lord. I don't wish trouble upon any of us, but if it finds us, and they come and they speak evil of us because we're trying to serve our Lord. I'm going to tell you what, I feel sorry for them. That's who I feel sorry for. And I pray the Lord to get a hold of them. If they ain't been saved, that they will be saved. And if they have been and they've grown so cold and so distant from God, that God will get a hold of them and get them right where they need to be. This is our effort. This is what the Lord laid on me. I, I don't know why. Other than that's what it is, and we live in a country today, I'm going to tell you what, they hate that which is right. Hate it. Hate the truth. Everything is upside down in this country today, and they would despise and probably do despise not only myself, but anybody that would speak in the name of our Lord and Savior, because in speaking His name, it condemns them in their sins. This is our effort this morning. I pray that the Lord is pleased, and I pray that God will bless you. Thank you for listening.